a male a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two door posts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, as a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall remove leaven out of your houses, for if anyone eats what is leavened, from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations, a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this rite as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? You should say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshipped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. At midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night, and said, Up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel, and go, serve the Lord as you have said. Take your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and be gone, and bless me also. The Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses had told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. And the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not left, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. The time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of 430 years, on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So the same night is a night of watching kept to the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. 
No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. All the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native of the land. But no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is mine. Then Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand the Lord brought you out from this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. And when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give to you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days, no leavened bread shall be seen with you, and no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign on your hand, and as a memorial between your eyes, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this statute at its appointed time from year to year. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and your fathers, and shall give it to you, you shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of your animals that are males shall be the Lord's. As the firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with the lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. Every firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. And when in time to come your son asks you, What does this mean? You shall say to him, By a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. For when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. It shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes, for by a strong hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Thank you, Katie. That's quite a lot of stamina. Uh, let's, let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you, as, as Grant said earlier, thank you that you... And you speak to us that, that even though you are um, uh, such a, a God beyond our imaginations, that you you in, in some ways stoop down to speak to us so that we can we can know you personally. And I pray that now, as we um, as we think about what these words mean for us, that you would speak to us by your Spirit now, and that we might grow uh, to know and to obey you even more than we do at the moment. Amen. Okay, well, uh, Freya sat in, in a pew in her church as her pastor explained the bread and the wine to the congregation again. Um, this is the body of Christ, he said, as he held up the bread, broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ, as he held up the wine, shed for you. And as we eat this bread and drink uh, from this cup together, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. A little while later, Freya found herself um, being, being given bread and wine by a an old lady in her church, and, and this lady smiled at her nicely, but, but Freya avoided eye contact. Because on the outside that Sunday, Freya looked like anyone else in church. She looked like she normally did. But on the inside, Freya knew that her week had not been honouring to God uh, at all. She'd been drinking heavily with her friends a couple of nights that week. She had, As she reflected back, she'd said things. She'd told jokes with her friends that she was ashamed to even think about. So she sat in a pew that morning. Uh, she'd embarrassed herself in, in many ways. And she and her boyfriend had gone further physically than she knew had been right that week as well. And so as the bread and the wine were passed to her that Sunday, Freya was she sort of stopped in her tracks. She was a Christian, she'd made a commitment, she'd been baptised. She wanted to live a Christian lifestyle. But she felt that Sunday kind of overcome with guilt. Could she take part in communion this Sunday morning? Surrounded by so many other godly people that she knew. Would, would Christ accept her? What 
what does God have to say to someone like Freya tonight? Well, we've, we've had our passage read for us tonight, um, but before we talk about that Exodus 12 and 13, where have we been so far in this series? Let me just lower this a little bit. Uh, so the Israelites, God's chosen people, have uh, they were enslaved in Egypt under an oppressive rule of Pharaoh. And even when they asked him for mercy, remember, well, he, didn't, he didn't let off the workload. He called them lazy liars. And he increased their workload even more. Uh, abusive, narcissistic leadership uh, is as old as the pyramids. So the Lord sent Moses with his brother Aaron to go to Pharaoh and tell them, tell him, let my people go. Famous phrase. But look down at the end of last week's passage, at the end of chapter 11. Uh, chapter 11, verse 9. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh, and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. So that's what we saw last week. Despite all of God's mighty displays of power, despite many signs and wonders, river turned into blood, uh, insects and frogs invading every home, crops wiped out, the sun itself disappearing from the sky. Despite all of it, despite God proving himself to be the Lord of all creation, defeating every one of the Egyptians' gods one by one, even so, Pharaoh was stubborn in his sin to the point of insanity, and he refused to let Israel go. So God gave him one last threat. If you want to flick all the way back to Exodus chapter 4 with me, we see that threat promised all the way from there. God knew where this battle with Pharaoh was going to go from the very beginning. It was going to be a battle to the death. Chapter 4, verse 21 says this. The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I have put in your power, but I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, Let my son go, that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. So the Lord, Yahweh, remember that's, that's the name we've seen for God uh, in this book. It's what he gave himself in chapter 3, I am who I am. The Lord called Israel his firstborn son. Now what does that mean? You know, in, in, in our day, in our time, in our culture, which sibling is born first doesn't actually matter that very much. Um, except maybe some squ- sibling squabbles. But in the ancient world, it, it, it's a huge deal. The firstborn son was the heir. Uh, he was the one who would receive the inheritance from his parents. And here the Lord God says that he has chosen to give an inheritance to, uh, to Israel. He's chosen to give them privileges as his firstborn. Israel is to receive an inheritance from the Lord. And so God says, Pharaoh, let my son go so that he may serve me. He may worship me. Remember last week we saw those two words in Hebrew at the same root. Worship, serve. Um, and, and if you don't, says the Lord, then I will take away your firstborn son instead. Until we arrive in chapter 12, which, which Katie read for us. It's midnight in Egypt. The air is, is sticky. It's hot. Everything is still and quiet. Not even a breeze disturbs your sleep. But then suddenly you're awakened by your next door neighbour's cries, cry of despair. Then a minute later, another from the house across the street, another in the distance, and another, and another, and another, until you almost instinctively get up and rush to your older brother's bedroom. Chapter 12, verse 30, there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Pharaoh sent that messengers to Moses and Aaron and tells them to take the Israelites and go. Take your women, take your children, take your livestock with you, go, get out. And the Egyptian people urge the Israelites out. They, they push them from the land before they don't have time to bake a proper lunch to take with them. And the Egyptians thrust silver and jewellery and clothing at the Israelites to try and make them to leave faster. Uh, they are so afraid of what this God might do to them next. God brought Israel out. They were no longer slaves of Pharaoh, servants of Pharaoh, worshippers of Pharaoh. Now they belong to the Lord. They are Yahweh's, they are slaves of him, servants of Yahweh, worshippers of Yahweh. 
And so the rest of this long passage, um, which Katie read for us, is instructions about what they must do to remember what God has done. Like a sandwich either side of of those accounts, we've got uh, instructions to the Israelites of what is going to be an annual festival. Uh, One they will keep through all the generations forever, God says. They are to structure their whole calendar around this. It's going to be the first month of their year. Uh, this will be the beginning of their year. It's like a new age. Something, something new has happened. Uh, God calls it a sign for them. It's twice called a memorial. Five times God calls it a statute. Statute forever. This is going to be part of their, their new cultural and, and uh, ethnic identity as a people. Well, why? Why such uh, a repetition in these instructions? Because God wants them to remember clearly who they are. Chapter 13, verse 3. Uh, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of slavery. For by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out from this place. Remember. Remember. And there are three parts to this annual Passover meal that are mentioned in this passage, and which to this very day form the basis of the Passover meal when Jews sit down every year to eat it together. Uh, chapter 12, verse 8. They shall eat the lamb's flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. So they were to eat bitter herbs, roast lamb and unleavened bread. So tonight what I want to do really is to take each of those three in turn and, and understand something of the symbolism of what is going on uh, in this meal. So let's start with the bitter herbs. And they were to eat bitter herbs at Passover. Uh, according to tradition, the bitter herbs correlate to the bitterness of slavery in Egypt. It's the same word as in chapter 1, verse 13. The Egyptians made their lives bitter with hard service. So traditional things to eat uh, by, by Jews are horseradish root or parsley dipped in salt water, which is supposed to represent Israelite tears when they were slaves. Uh, but, but Jews are spread out throughout the world now, so they do different things based on their kind of where they live. But the point is the same regardless. The Israelites were free from Egypt, but they were to remember the bitterness from which they had been redeemed. And we too are called to remember the bitterness of our own slavery. This is the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 2. Uh, Joel actually read this passage at the start, uh, part of it. Remember that you were once separated from Christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Remember, remember the bitterness of your slavery to sin, because then you can remember that you play no part in your redemption. It's all God's works as born in that passage, so be humble about it. Our redemption from, from bitter slavery was not physical, uh, it was spiritual. We were, we were not just victims of oppression. We were, we were sinners. We were the perpetrators, actually. We were not innocent uh, slaves. But actually, here's the key thing to notice in the Passover account. Neither, actually, were the Israelites just innocent slaves. Let's ask a, pa- a question about passage. During the Passover, what's the difference between the Egyptian households and the Israelite households? What's the difference between them? How many died in each Egyptian household? One, right? Uh, Chapter 12, verse 12. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. God is judging sin or idolatry in Egypt. The firstborn in every household shall die. One. One dies. But how many died in each Israelite household? None, right? Zero. Not quite. Chapter 12, verse 6. You shall keep your lambs until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. How many die in each Israelite household? One. Just like the Egyptian households. It was either the firstborn or it was a lamb. There was death in every household. Look at chapter 12, verse 26. Look at how the Passover lamb is described there. Uh, When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, 
It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. When he passed over the houses of the people of Israel and Egypt, when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. The lambs died as a sacrifice. The lambs died in place of the firstborn sons of Israel. God was coming to judge sin and idolatry in every household. And sin and idolatry existed in every Israelite home, just as it did in every Egyptian home. We saw last week Israel's lack of trust. We saw their bitterness towards God. We saw how they had sold out in Egypt in so many ways. They were identifying themselves as Pharaoh's servants, Pharaoh's worshippers. That's who they saw themselves as. And we'll see in future weeks that, that Israel is not, is not a, an innocent people who trust God with their whole hearts. Because sin and idolatry exist in every human heart. Every human descended from Adam. Every one of us. We've inherited that sin and that guilt from him. But as God passed from Egypt that night, he accepted the lambs as a sacrifice in place of the firstborn sons of Israel. And so the Israelites were to remember as they left Egypt, as they celebrated every single year from, from then on, they were to remember, to remember that they were redeemed by sacrifice. By sacrificing a lamb at the temple at Passover every single year. And then roasting it and eating it. Now, of course, there's no temple uh, in Jerusalem anymore for them to sacrifice lambs at. The second Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 70 AD and has never been rebuilt. So there is no lamb eaten at Passover anymore. Uh, instead, Jews today put a, a lamb shank bone in the middle of their table often. To, to remind themselves, to remember still. But all that tells us something, doesn't it? That tells us that there was a work left to do. After all, can a lamb ever really be a human substitute, a, a substitute for a human life? Can human sin and idolatry really justly be paid by an animal? You know, even in our human law courts, we would find that ridiculous, wouldn't it? Imagine a, a convicted criminal and his or her dog goes to jail in their place. It's, it's a laughable idea, isn't it? So why would it be any different for a perfect and holy and just and righteous God? Those Israelite lambs slain in, in Goshen back in the Passover and then slain every year in the temple afterwards, those lambs without blemish, they were not the final sacrifice. They were not really the sacrifice at all. They were just pointers. They were pointers to a greater sacrifice that was to come. Many centuries later, as John the Baptist ministered in the wilderness, he saw Jesus Christ of Nazareth walking towards him. And what did he say? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ was perfect. He was like those parts of the lambs without blemish. And without spiritual blemish, without sin. He was fully God. He was God the Son, one with the Father. As he died on the cross, he was able fully and sufficiently to deal with sin on our behalf. To do what no lamb or, or no one else could do. To take the full weight of God's wrath against our sin and idolatry. To bear it all. To free us from sin. To conquer death by rising again. And he was also fully human. He was born of a woman. He was not only capable of dealing with sin because he was God, but he was also justly able to stand in our place on our behalf as one of us. Because he is one of us. He is our new Adam. He's a new head of a new humanity. All those in Christ Jesus are redeemed by his sacrifice. It's like his blood covers the doorframe of the household of God. God's not fooled. Uh, he wasn't fooled at the Passover by the blood on the door frames. He knew the sin inside the Israelite homes. He knows the sin in your life. He knew all that Freya had done that week. Not just what she presented outwardly at church on a Sunday. But for those in Christ, for those wanting to turn away from their sin and live under his will, committed to him, God looks at Christ's blood painted on our hearts and he passes over us for judgment. 
bitter herbs reminding us of our slavery to sin, roast lamb reminding us of the sacrifice of our perfect saviour. But actually it's the third part of the meal which gets the most mentions in this passage by far. The unleavened bread. Now, what is unleavened bread? Leaven is, is rising agent for the baking, like yeast. Well, leaven is mentioned 18 times in this passage. Uh, the Israelites are told over and over and over and over again that they are to have no leaven in their houses for the whole week of this annual festival. Don't eat any leaven, don't smell any leaven, don't look at any leaven, don't even talk about leaven, don't even shut your eyes and picture leaven uh, in your mind. Right, it doesn't say that's last you, but you get the idea. To this day, Jewish families all over the world, they, and they almost do a ceremony uh, to remove leaven from their homes. They play little games with their kids where you know, the parents hide a bit of leaven somewhere in the house, the kids go around and play a game finding it, even if it's a, a small little kind of pile of yeast at the back of a shelf or something they have to sweep up. It's all to remember the Israelites leaving Egypt in a hurry and having no time to let their bread rise because they have to leave so quickly. Which, if that's all it was, would be a pretty weird tradition, wouldn't it? Uh, just, you know, we're making this big tradition because of some bread that we didn't get time to bake properly. Uh, but let's see what the Apostle Paul made of it. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. Look this up with me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 in the New Testament. This is what he says. Uh, so this is, this is the context, verse 1, this is what's going on in the Corinthian church. He says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans, for a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant, ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. So the Corinthian church is not taking seriously the blatant sin that exists in their church community. Now look at verse 6. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Paul's using... The Passover festival is a picture to us. Have any of you made sourdough bread before? Um, we've had lockdowns the last few years, I'm sure uh, lots of you have tried it. But basically, you start with a little bowl of flour and water, and, and as, it, as it has time, you kind of leave it there, and it kind of bubbles and it grows. And, and you can use most of it to bake a loaf of bread, but you, you leave a part behind, and that forms the, the starter of the next loaf. And it continues to grow, and you can use it the next time. You might have seen a similar thing with, with kind of cake batch stuff being passed around different homes. So, so one person will make a cake with this kind of uh, leaven stuff and then they'll save a little bit and they can pass it on to someone else they know who can then make that into a cake and they save a bit and that gets passed on and so on and so on. Um, so if you're in the habit of regularly making sourdough or if you're an Israelite baker in the ancient world, then that's what you did. You keep a little bit of this leaven, this kind of starter mixture, in your kitchen all the time. And your loaves of bread are a little bit kind of generational. They all come from the very first batch in some way. They are descended from it, if you like. Um, but what is Paul saying? He's saying that Christ, the Passover lamb, has been sacrificed, not just to forgive past sins, but to make you a new lump. You see in verse 7, I don't know how you feel about being called a lump. Uh, but there we have it. There we have, he says, God's redeemed people are like a lump of unleavened, unleavened bread. What happened to the Israelites' bread when they left Egypt? Well, they left their old batch of leaven, their kind of starter mixture, descended from all their previous loaves of bread. They left it behind. They baked unleavened bread. And then they had to start again with a new batch afterwards. And Paul says it's a picture of what's happened to them. They're a new people now. They weren't connected to their old life anymore. They, they were a new, unleavened lump of bread. And that's what Paul says we are too. In Christ, we are made new. We are totally unconnected from our past life when we become Christians. 
You are no longer in Adam. You're no longer descended from those previous batches. You are now in Christ. Which is why we must take sin so seriously. As seriously as rooting around in our homes for any tiny speck of yeast that we must sweep away at the back of a shelf. And this is also why uh, God makes Israel consecrate every firstborn son from then on. That's the slightly odd last part of our passage. Chapter 13, verse 12, uh, back in Exodus. 13, verse 12 says this. You shall set apart to the Lord all that first opens the womb. Every firstborn son has to be redeemed by a sacrifice when he was born. Uh, Mary and Joseph did this with Jesus as well. You might remember that story. They go to the temple with him when he's, when he's born to make a sacrifice. And when Jewish children ask what this is about, says God, they were to tell them, uh, chapter 13, verse 15, when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of animals. Therefore... I sacrifice to the Lord all the males that first opened the womb, that's meaning animals, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem and make a sacrifice for. All to remind them that you have been bought with a price. You are not your own. You belong to God. You've been redeemed. You've been bought. You've been made new. You've been given a new start. You've got a new identity now. The whole part of a meal was God's constant reminder, God's lesson to his people through food, a call for them every year to remember. Remember what you've been redeemed from with bitter herbs. Remember what you've been redeemed with, with roast lamb. Remember what you've been redeemed to with unleavened bread. Uh, but there's time, yeah, there's time for one bonus point. Uh, Jesus fulfilled the events of the Passover when he died on the cross, but he also fulfilled the annual Passover meal itself when he ate supper with his disciples the night before he died. Uh, let me read from, from Luke 22. You can either look that up or you can just listen. That's fine. Um, let's read from Luke 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And then down at verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus reclined at table, and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus and his disciples, they ate the Passover together. They said the traditional bread, prayers, they broke the unleavened bread, they drank the ceremonial cups of wine. And then Jesus, in the meal, he stands up and he says, this is about me. This whole tradition, this whole statue forever, this has been about me. Do this now in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper, we sometimes call it communion. And as Christians, this is now our sign. This is now our memorial. This is our statute forever. Our uh, new Passover meal. Which means in one sense, when, when Freya is stopped in her tracks that Sunday morning as she's passed the bread and the wine, in one sense, communion is doing what it's meant to. It's acting as a reminder of who she is not anymore. She is no longer a slave to sin. She no longer belongs to this world. She, sin is no longer who she is. She has been living that week like an Israelite who has been freed from slavery and yet is now trying to run back in. She's, she's trying to push her way back through the desperate, uh, urgent crowd of Egyptians who are trying to get rid of her and she's trying to kneel on the floor again before Pharaoh. It's a ridiculous image, isn't it? That's what Freya's doing. 
And as she has passed the bread and wine, she remembers and recognises that her life has not been right and that she must repent and turn away from her old sin. Whenever you take communion, whenever you take part in the Lord's Supper, it is a call to remember who you are not anymore. But there's something else the phrase forgetting. Because the Lord's Supper is also a call to remember who you now are. This is where Freya can have hope as she holds the bread and the wine in her hands. Because each time we take communion together, we in some way join in with those disciples in the upper room 2,000 years ago. Because Jesus himself, by his spirit, is holding out his body and his blood to us so that we receive him by faith. This is what John Calvin said, a 16th century pastor and reformer. He wrote this, In this way the Lord was pleased by calling himself the bread of life, not only to teach that our salvation is treasured up in the faith of his death and resurrection, but also by virtue of true communication with him, his life passes into us and becomes ours, just as bread when taken for food gives vigour to the body. As Freya eats the bread and drinks the wine, she can be reminded of what Christ has done. She is encouraged that her feeling of of grief at her sin, her desire to change, that she's encouraged that's a sign that that God is at work in her by by his spirit. And as she then puts her faith and puts her trust in Christ again, the Holy Spirit makes her union with Christ more real to her again. She remembers who she is in Jesus. She can look up at that old lady serving her and smile back. She doesn't have to dodge eye contact. She can look around the whole church at all of her brothers and sisters and smile at them. She can know that that this is her people. This is who she is now. She's a new lump. However she's feeling about herself that week, this is her identity. Jesus himself is ministering to her heart through the bread and the wine. So the call this morning is to remember, this morning, this evening, is to remember. When you feel the pull back to your old life, uh, towards sin and idolatry, remember. Remember that in Christ, that's not you anymore. The bitterness of sin, that's not yours anymore. And when you feel the weight of your sin and your shame, remember. Remember your perfect sacrificial lamb without blemish, who takes away the sin of the world. And whenever you feel hopeless for change or keeping going in the faith, then remember. Remember who you are now. Remember that you have been bought and redeemed, called to service the slavery to worship of a new master. You are part of a new people. You're a new person. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for what you have done. This whole passage is is a description of what you have done. This has nothing to do with us. You have taken us uh, slaves to sin, dead in sin, unable to help ourselves. You have taken us and you have redeemed us. You have bought us with the precious blood of Christ. We thank you so much. You have made us new. You have made us part of your new people. And Father, for those who who are sitting here knowing that they are struggling with particular sin, I pray for freedom for them. Would you, would you encourage them? Would you remind them of who they are in Christ? For all of us, as we go into the next week, as we, uh, as we live in ways that are not honouring to you, Father, we pray that you would help us to root out sin in our lives, knowing who we are in Christ. Thank you so much for what you have done. Father, by your Spirit, make our, our union with Christ even more fresh and new to us every day. Would we remember? Father, teach us to remember what you have done. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing again. So let's, let's stand up. So I can take another one. Stop it, just stand up.